Clyde, thanks for joining me. And so the floor is yours. Tell me about your startup. What, what's your pitch? Perfect. So, so Value AI is a company uh, that I've been running for about a year now, as is this name. Uh, but it's actually something I've been doing for about 20, 25 years um, as, as a concept and a methodology. Um, and we've built a SaaS product uh, that goes with that down. And this goes back to scaling um, what I've always done as an individual contributor uh, into something that can be used by many people. And at its essence, we are helping customers uh, find the value in the digital transformation projects. So when you are doing a project, why are you doing it? How do you prioritize it? What's the return or why are you doing it? Which would be a risk reduction, uh, ESG, you know, environmental sustainability um, uh, item, uh, or a, a cost save, which would be the common thing that people look at. You know, we're going to do a uh, upgrade a whole lot of laptops because we're going to give better user experience to our users. That's going to have a, a cost to it, but what's the benefit to the users? Well, it's greater productivity, better stability, um, those sorts of things. Um, so my methodology that we've been using uh, for years is a way for when I work with customers so that for them to understand what their objectives are, how to achieve them, and then to basically um, prioritize it based on what the value will be. And that's why we use the word value. Um, and uh, it's, it's been working really well the, the last couple of years uh, in, in various industries. Very nice. Yeah. So can you maybe elaborate on who your customers are? You say customers in general, is it just any business that's looking for a digital transformation? Uh, yeah. Um, and, and this is always a tricky thing with a platform like this. You can really apply it to, to anything. Um, so we have, we've focused primarily on, on businesses that don't have a governance project structure. So um, projects are, are usually delivered on a, on a best efforts hero basis. So that's, a, that's usually a good spot for us to come in and, and help somebody. We, we put in um, some very simple ways of working and, and, a, and, a, and a workflow in, in how to approach these, these projects um, to the big enterprise customers, you know, 60,000, 120,000, 400,000 users where there's lots of stuff going on and you still need to prioritize and you still need to calculate um, what that value is going to look like. Uh, and, and that could be valued over multiple years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a broad, it is a broad spectrum. Uh, and, and the kind of customers that I'm talking to at the moment are in that sort of 50 to 150,000 range. Uh, and as I talking to, I'm working with at the moment to, to show value uh, in what they're doing. And, and you say 50 to 150,000 uh, users. Yes. So that means employees is another way to look at Correct. it. So big, Correct. big yeah. enterprise customers. Um, so Correct. what's an example? So it sounds, and correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like you're almost a consultant for these enterprise customers that, and you walk them through whatever the assigned project is. Is that fair or is it more yeah. focused well, than that? It, yeah, no, 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 and that's exactly, I'm a, I'm a consultant and that's where the product came in is that I was doing a lot of this consulting work uh, over the years. And one of the biggest things I used to get back as feedback is, is why can't we scale this? Like how, how can you do this that you don't have to always be involved? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in those days, you know, sort of 10, 15, 20 years ago, the only way to do it then would have been to build some platform from scratch. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I say build, I mean, literally code it up. And with the way things have gone now with low code and no code technology, you can configure things really quickly. So we've configured my workflow or my approach into a software as a service product. So I still do some consulting, uh, but the go to market is through partners. So the partners might do the consulting. Uh, and then for those customers that are um, a little bit more hands-on, let's say, they can use the product themselves. So we might get to a situation with some customers, and, and it's I'm starting to see it with some that are that are really taking taking the um, the learnings on, that they won't need me in six months' time because they know how to do it though, and they're using the tool. Mm -hmm. And 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 the tool has been designed, you know, to the smallest person company, you know, five person company could use it. That you have um, the way to set objectives the way to set key results, which is the methodology we, we use as a starting point, to create tasks and allocate them. That's all pretty easy to do. And then how we do the prioritization, which is really the, the, the secret source, um, that's got a framework that you use within the tool. So what often happens when I'm brought in is they've got a, custom, they've got a project that's running and uh, they've each, either reached, reached a point that it's gone off track completely and they don't know how to bring it back on. So it's a turnaround or, or a restating of a project or they've been running the project for so long, they don't know why they're running the project anymore. Like the original business case is long, is long moved away from where they are now. 
Um, mm -hmm. because the variables have changed, the sponsors have changed, whatever it is. So you have to reset and say, okay, you started this project because you're going to do, um, I don't know, I'm trying to give a simple example. You're going to, you're going to go buy 7,000 laptops for your users. And, um, you've now realized using the data that you've got that you only need to buy 600. So how do you do your business case now? Because you've already got the approval to go buy 7,000 laptops. So how do you yeah. now restate it so that you don't lose your, your budget? Cause you just, even though you've, you've got the budget uh, for this year, 2023, and you're not going to use it, you still want to have it for 2024. Um, mm -hmm. Because now you've sweat, you, you, you still, you're now you're sweating the assets a bit longer. So you're making 2023 look like a better year, but you still have the problem coming up in 2024. So just restating that and then moving along logically. Um, some people struggle with, with um, articulating that in, in a nice, simple way. Um, the other thing yeah. to do, in that is, is say like in the information security frame, if you're going to do an ISO 27K controls, you have to apply are, are repeatable things. And so what, so let me, let me break it down to a few things that, that I've collected over the years. One is this methodology that we use. So that's pretty straightforward. And then there's repeatable things that I see all the time. So we call them scenarios in the product. So it's a scenario is a problem and a solution. So when we see this problem, we give you recommendations of what you do to fix it or, or mm -hmm. to address it. So we apply that to to multiple domains um, or, or groupings. So information security, um, end user computing, um, uh, environmental sustainability. So we've got all these these pre used uh, pre uh, pre canned templates and then scenarios you can use, and then that gives the user who's using our product the ability to know what to do, know how to prioritize the work because they've got they've got values they can use to to create the scale or understand the scale of their problem, and then what the value will be and then execute on it. So we take a lot of thinking out of it because we're now giving a lot of things to just work with and, and tweak more than start from scratch. Yeah, so I, I think it sounds really interesting. It, it sounds like something I'm not super familiar with, but would it be fair to say that it's essentially kind of a, a project management platform? Um, or is that not a fair assessment? How would you, no, in layman, yeah. layman's terms? It, 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 it's, it's, it's such a, yeah, I mean, it, it is a project management tool, but we're not trying to sell it as a project management tool. So, okay. um, so we don't, we don't, for example, consider ourselves competitors to Asana or Monday or Jira or any of those things. But mm -hmm. we're much more a, is, we're much more of an expert system. So, what is an expert okay. system? We we capture we capture knowledge. So scenarios are capturing knowledge, templates are capturing knowledge, ways of doing things, and then we're helping use that expertise to go and solve a problem or reach an objective. Um, and this is the thing that I've found throughout my career. You can have the best project management tool, but if you don't actually have the, if you don't actually have the experience or the know-how to go and solve the problem, it doesn't matter. And, um, and so just really quick, does mm -hmm. your SaaS product, it cap captures specific scenarios. So you say, Hey, we have these a hundred expert scenarios that other enterprises have run across and therefore you can use our template to solve the same problem within your organization. Co correct. So we, so we provide okay. a list of, of scenarios and templates and we, uh, we work with partners. So we'll have a partner that has a whole bunch of customers and the partners will de develop their scenarios and templates that they want their customers to use. So if you think about now in the, the sort of SaaS environment, which is the new, I say new, but it's where we're going now with some of the work we're doing. So you've got and sold your product to a customer. They, they've paid for a year in advance and you get to the end of the year and the customer says, I don't see any value here. Like, why am I paying for this thing? Whatever it mm -hmm. does, let's say it's, let's say it's an accounting package. Um, you know, I've been using your accounting package and it, and it doesn't actually add any value in my life. So what we would do typically is when you are signing the deal with the customer, we'll work out what that roadmap is to value. Um, and that would be setting out what are the objectives? So, whatever the benefits of having your accounting package, let's say you're very good at tax classifications or expense classifications, you've got some sort of natural language testing or something like that, it speeds up that process. So you're saving, my, you're saving the customer's time in having to do classification because that's a pain. You know, you've got a thousand transactions a month, you gotta classify all of them manually, it's a pain. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, some companies have 10,000, 20,000, 100,000. Um, then you talk about sex, uh, sales taxes or VAT. Um, you know, these are very complicated things because every jurisdiction has different classifications and, and how the, the VAT or, or, or uh, sales tax is applied. So maybe that's a second feature that your, your tool provides. 
Uh, and then your third feature maybe is a um, for your end users when they do their expense claims. Um, you don't have to you don't have to capture anything. You just have to scan the receipt, um, mm -hmm. and it'll automatically pick up all the details and classify it correctly. So those are your three things. But those things don't happen you know necessarily magically. You, you, you need to set it up in the environment. You need to train the people. You need to um, make sure that everyone knows how to use it. So that roadmap that we would set up, or with the customers, the, the, our customer and their customer would, would sit down and, and plan, would be, what are your three objectives that you would use over the next coming three quarters, with the key results being the, the level below that? So if the goal is to train all users, is, is your first objective, and then the key results is each business line, uh, from finance down to the end user who's going to be on the road, for example. That might be your first objective. So that'll be the first step of the roadmap. Then your second step of the roadmap would be to confirm all the classifications are working and tune them. Because once you start running transactions going through, you need to make sure that they're actually working correctly. Because you know, no matter how good the machine learning is or whatever you're using, there'll be some tuning. Um, and then mm -hmm. the third thing would be, uh, you know, through that process is confirming all your submissions. Uh, here in the UK, we do um, VAT, which is a value added tax or sales tax, as part of an automated uh, thing to the, the revenue service, um, you need to make sure those are all working. So your third objective might be to validate that all the stuff is working 100%. So now you end of three quarters. Customers paid you for um, the product. You've had a structured plan to work with them to show value. So in that last quarter, it's basically the mop-up or whatever it is, and you're validating now what you've done. And the customer's saying, you know what, this call's working great. I feel like all my people are trained. I feel like we're getting good data. I feel like we've done all our tax and compliance stuff, so we're good there. I have no problem with doing my renewal because I, I clearly get what I want out of this. Now, what we would probably do as an extra thing is to calculate all the time we've saved, all the risks we've avoided through that process and put a dollar value to that. And, they, and that dollar mm -hmm. value will come not only from a compliance finding point of view, but it'll also come from the productivity saving. So you're going to up, you know, your accounting people, your end users, et cetera. So, and, and there's ways and means you, you calculate the stuff. But what it's basically saying is let's say that product costs 10 grand to put in place and the saving was 100 grand for easy math that's a 10x return mm -hmm. so there's your value we did a 10 we did a 10x return for you as a as a customer and the customer's going you know what that's great i'll happily pay for this next 10 years like but from a psychological behavioral point of view that's that's what they're getting because it's not so much about the numbers it's the comfort and the trust that they've been handled in the right way um, to get to yeah. a good object, a good outcome. So that's what we do as a full service with the, with the product, with our product. Got it. So yeah, in in that scenario, the your customer is the accounting firm or accounting service provider or accounting software provider. Correct. 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 To the to the and customer of the accounting software. Yeah, and you're essentially providing that accounting software provider a roadmap to make their product more successful or provide demonstrate value it's providing correct correct and we and we don't just do it at the end we're doing it all the time so depending yeah. on the on the measurements so for example when i when i work with a customer we'll work out the business case we'll work out the plan and then we'll work out the checkpoints we're going to have a, along the way and then we'll collect those checkpoints as we go so so you'll always know as the um we'll call the provider to the to the customer the, the provider always know what they're providing to the customer. The customer will always know if they're on track with the provider. So they can always adjust. Because that's what happens often is that everyone starts off great, you know, sign the deal, we get the, the customer success guys involved, and it's all like hunky-dory. And then people get busy, mm -hmm. and then they don't do anything anymore. And then all of a sudden, it gets to six months, and then nine months, and and it's like, well, we haven't done anything because of all these other priorities. Um, yeah. And then it's, I don't want to renew because I see no value. And the provider's going, well, we've tried so much to get something going with you. And the customer's going, well, you know, I'm not really going to go try the competitor because whatever. And then you just end up in the cycle of, of I'm going to give a very simplified example, but, you know, that's how, that's how it pretty much works in most cases. Okay. So you're helping, <clears throat> in the example, again, the accounting software firm engage their customer and through customer success, et cetera, to ensure that the uh, story the value that you're providing is not being lost 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah okay i think that makes sense and so maybe can we go into you said you sell through so sales channels you sell through partners who are those partners typically um 
so much, so so for this one we just talk, talked about now as the example the, the b2b SaaS provider who's ever built the software that would be who we would sell it through so they will have their customers so you know xyz provider will have 50 100 500 customers um we will be a bolt on to what they will sell to their customers uh, and whether we're a call down mm-hmm. line item or whether they absorb the cost depends on the deal um we go direct to to customers as well uh so when we have um a consultancy or a, or a managed service provider uh very similar to a SaaS provider that it'll be the same thing we'll go to a consultancy they'll use our product to, with their customers uh and whether they sell it onto the customers or whether they absorb the cost is up to them uh and and, and then all of these things we're, we're the expert system we're helping them to, to retain their collateral their their expertise so they can reuse it with their customers in a clean way um so the scenarios are always not customer specific until they use it with that customer and then it becomes tailored to that customer if you understand my my logic um and then direct mm-hmm. direct sales as well if we if we have those come up well okay so help me understand is the the partner paying you so again going back to the example is that the accounting software firm is paying you a SaaS fee it yes it, it'll depend on the deal so um so one of them, for example, they will pass it on to their customer. So when the customer mm-hmm. signs up, they will pay, you know, the ten grand to the accounting firm, the the, the provider, and they'll add on our fee on top of that, uh, based on number of users and, and what they're going to be doing. Uh, there's another one which I'm, do, I'm doing at the moment where they are happy to absorb the cost of us, still on a per user basis, but the customer, it's a white labeled thing. The customer doesn't know it's a separate system, and um, you know they see it as part of the de- part of the offering. Um, to okay. their customers. So it just depends on the deal. We're flexible in that respect. And in terms of the pricing that you charge, does it depend on the deal or is it just a typically a per user um, fee? Yeah, we, we typically at this stage are going on per user. Um, although I'd, I'd like to not be on per user because I think per user can be quite limiting. Um, I mean, it does slide downwards the more users you have. But I'd like to get to a point where we're agreeing on a value proposition and, and that's, that's what it is uh, to the business. Um, it just depends on, on how close we are to the, the actual customer who's paying for it so we can have those conversations. But per user is the basic, the easiest way to explain it to somebody. And does it vary? Do you charge different by deal for a per user? So it just depends on the deal for what you're going to charge per user. Is it typically a flat fee regardless of customer? No, like I said, it, sc- it scales down. Uh, so so you, you start at, at um, the initial per user depending on how many number of users and as you go up, it goes less. Uh, to point and then we also add in uh, consulting time as well on top so if they want to have you know what me or one of my team involved there's a certain allocation depending on what tier they're on uh, and that could be just sort of a coaching um, engagement or it could actually be us running the project and de- doing the delivery uh, it really depends on the on the customer okay and I and let me know what you're comfortable sharing, but are, are you willing to share like in the past 12 months, what you've done in sales or what, what your current ARR is? Um, we are, we're still pretty early. Um, so the product's only going out now commercially to customers. So we had, we had a lot of pilots on it. Um, so from that point of view, there's nothing on, there's, there's no ARR or, or, or even that on, on the product itself. Um, but from a consulting point of view, we do, you know, fairly well in the five figure, six figure uh, per month range. Um, okay. so, you know, the, 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 sorry, the intention of the irony the intention is that the, what we're doing now is in, in advisory work as, as resources, we can 10 X that just by having our own software doing some of it. Um, okay. So you're still in that transition phase again. I think you mentioned that you've been doing the consulting piece of it for a long time and it's like, okay, now how do I, like you said, leverage that expertise through software? Correct. Correct. So, so the pilots we've been running with the software, we knew, so we've had customers that we've consulted to with our software in the background being used and, and with the customer seeing it, et cetera. But we, they haven't had to pay for the software yet. They've gotten that as, as, as a free uh, thing because we're testing the software out. Uh, now we're going down the routes. That, that now we've finished all that pilot stuff. Literally at the end of this month, we go live uh, and everyone gets access to come and buy it. Okay. And so what's, uh, when is that launch date? Do you have a specific date? We're, we're aiming at the end of this month, end of August. 
Okay. No, I, that, yeah. that's exciting. So what, let's maybe talk about growth plans or goals. So if you're launching at the end of August, what, what are your expectations a year down the line, five years down the line? Um, I, I would like to get probably a hundred customers a year on the platform. That's, that's pretty much the goal. Um, in, and we're not talking about customers, we're talking about the end customers using the platform. Um, mm -hmm. that's, pr that's pretty good for us. I think from a growth point of view and from, um, the scaling, scaling the performance of the product, because there is quite a few things we do in calculations and stuff. So we need to grow, but grow it at a, at a rate that we can make sure we always live in a good quality of service. Uh, but at the end of five years, I want to be close to 500, 600 companies on the platform. Okay. Uh, and, and tied in, sorry, go. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to, I'm thinking through this and then as going back to the accounting software example, as long as the end customer continues using that accounting software, is it fair to say they would just continue to use your software as well? I'm just trying to think about the Correct. lifetime so, value of your customer. You, you expect it to be pretty sticky. Yeah. So, so the intention is that even, even, and in all the deals we've, we've discussed with, with, uh, as part of the commercial arrangements is that even if they were to get rid of the service provider, the, the, of the, the, the SaaS provider in this case that we're talking about, mm -hmm. we would still be an option that they could pick up to just continue with. So they don't necessarily lose us um, if they decide to change accounting packages. Um, so that's the intention is, is we're, we're, we're priced at a point that is as sticky as sticky can be because we're a very high multiple of value for what they're paying for. And is it fair to say that the, so you're in on the customer's accounting software, obviously they use other SaaS tools, they use HR management or, or uh, marketing software. Is, does your product also apply to those different types of software or, or departments of an organization? Uh, not yet, but there's nothing stopping it being applied in those areas because the scenarios okay. are pro problems and solutions and they just by category. So we've got end user compute because that's the one I know the most. Information security is the one I know probably the second most about. Uh, and, and within our people, that's where we spend most of our time. Um, but you know, I've had a conversation around marketing and you know creating scenarios for marketing. We put together ESG um, scenarios in, a, in about a day. Um, because they're not, when I say not difficult to do, but it just it just takes some brainstorming to apply what they are. Uh, so we we can apply in any domain, uh, and that's really the point. Is it becomes a tool that is reusable across an organization. Mm -hmm. So can we maybe talk about you said load and no code op options? Did this allow you to develop the software, the product yourself, or did you have to yeah. take on funding or outside resources? No, can you just talk about that that development yeah, process? I think that's sure. really interesting. Yeah, so we self-funded um, because we use a low-code, no-code platform. I, and I'll be honest, so we use Bubble. Bubble IO is the platform we used. Um, the biggest mistake I made there is I, I mean, I'm a technical person, um, but I did not stay close to this technically. Um, and the people we used to do the first version um, talked a good game, but were not good execution. At least up to my level of, mm -hmm. of what it should have been, and then you know it's my you know I take full full responsibility for that. But in the same token, we've got a product that now is pretty solid. Um, so we made that mistake early, uh, we, we rectified it. Um, but the low code, no code platform, the bubble platform specifically, has actually been really good. Uh, I mean, I, I don't spend a lot of time in it, but I can build something myself if I have, if I have an idea, and I'm sitting like nine o'clock at night on a, on a evening, and I'm like, oh, let me see if I can just build this thing. I can build it pretty much in three, four hours um, hmm. for it to be ready to go into the product. Maybe with a bit mm -hmm. of, okay, let's be fair. I'm not the, you know, I need someone to make it look pretty, but it's functional in three or four hours. I can, I can have something ready to use. Um, and that's, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I took the risk a year ago is because I wanted something, I didn't want to build something from scratch. I built a lot of stuff from scratch and it just takes too long and, and there's a lot of risk, but by doing it this way, we were able to get up and running. So, because it was because of the way the technology was built, or the way Bubbles built it specifically, and there's a, there's a few low code no code options. Um, you know, I've been able to build some stuff. We we've got a developer who's never used Bubble before, who is picking up and being able to build stuff, you know, faster and faster every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think having a developer background is really important. It really helps you be logical and how you approach things. 
Um, and then our product manager who's working on the project, she can go in and if she sees something, she can fix it. Now that kind of breaks the traditional developer, you know, development team role, roles and responsibilities and all that kind of stuff. But if it's a spelling error or it's a, um, a label that's in the wrong place, wrong font, all that kind of stuff, it, it, it doesn't matter if she goes and fixes that kind of stuff because that just saves us having to log a ticket or create a mm -hmm. task, have a discussion about it, all the rest of it. You know, you, you talk about a, a cosmetic change that takes her maybe 30 seconds to go and do because she can do branching and merging and all that kind of stuff because she's learned that in, in a couple of minutes of, of just looking at the tool. Um, mm -hmm. But in the minute in, in the minute it takes her to go and f fix it versus the five minutes or 10 minutes it would take to discuss it, create a task and put it in a sprint, that's been huge. And, yeah. and it sounds like a silly thing to pull out, but it is huge. And, I, you know, I sit in, in in a meeting and I'm, or I'm looking, I'm doing a demo and I'm making notes while I'm doing the demo. Going, oh, I must fix that thing there. I literally will go fix it off the meeting for five minutes, you know, in that gap that I might have. And that's been huge because, you know, in building stuff before, if you, if you notice something in a demo or, or working with a product, that would have to go through a whole life cycle chain to get fixed. Um, but you can do the quick stuff quickly, which is great. Now, there are, there are frustrations with it, with any sort of platform like this. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's the Excel problem. You can do a lot of stuff in Excel. Mm -hmm. The problem with Excel is it's Excel. It's flexible. So you can't constrain it very well. And then whenever you take something from Excel that's been free, you know, flexible, do whatever you want in it, to now into a system and the, and the user loses their flexibility, there's a level of frustration. It's the same thing mm -hmm. with using a low-code, no-code platform. You can do a lot of stuff with it, but there's stuff that's going to be frustrating. Um, so, for example, um, the way the guys built the UI in the first version, they put a lot of things in that was, were not good practices to using the platform. So now we've had to go mm -hmm. and undo all of those things. And, we've, and if we'd just known that they were doing that and we'd stopped in the beginning, we would have saved ourselves a huge amount of time. Not, in the, not only on the build side, but also now this cleanup side. Um, but functionally, it, it does a lot of stuff really well. It looks pretty decent. It uses, uh, it's got integration with Figma. So you can do your stuff in Figma and then import it into Bubble. So it looks good from that point of view. And then there's quite a good community around it in the sense of people building plugins and, and uh, widgets. So if you're looking for something like a graphical thing or, you know, I do a lot of calculations. So I was looking for a calculation thing. There's someone who's built it or is in the process mm -hmm. of building it. And you're paying like $20, $15 for a Gantt chart. Um, yeah. Just put in your project, you know, and that's, that's beautiful. Uh, so I, I almost liken it to a, a, if you had to go redo WordPress as a business mm -hmm. application product, to, it's like that because WordPress is very similar. Mm -hmm. You just go download the widgets, you import it and you use it. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, and, and I think that's one of the strengths we've, we've found. And we also don't worry about infrastructure. So everything, the price I pay to use it per month, I don't worry about any infrastructure. It's all part of the deal. So we get a certain level of capacity. We can boost that capacity up if we want to. Um, we can shrink it down if we want to, but I don't have to worry about servers. I don't have to worry about am I in AWS or in Azure or any of those things. So from a, mm -hmm. a resource point of view, we can stay pretty bootstrapped because I don't need to worry about other complications in my life. Um, yeah. We just worry about doing the work with the customer. So do you product. foresee yourself needing to raise funding down the line or is the plan to bootstrap this the, the whole way through? Um, you know, there's, there's, it's, that's, that's the founder's dilemma, I think. Mm -hmm. So when I asked all my friends who, who have done this before, it was 50-50. And, and one of them said, literally, like, don't give up any equity ever until you've bought the business, da 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 and the other ones were like, well, it's always easier if someone else is funding it and then you, you're not using your own money. Um, but then you, you've got to remember that you've got to control that money outflow. You can't be just hiring, spending, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kind of in the mm -hmm. middle of on that. So we, we self-funded to a point that my, my plan always was to self-fund, to build the product, to get a customer, one customer on, and then go look for funding. Because then I have not only validated the, I mean, I know it works because I've, I've been doing it for so long and I've, and I've run so many pilots, you know, uh, over the years for, for how it could work as a system. And I've built, I built the product in, in various other products as a, as a temporary solution to see if it would work. So I've done a lot of that stuff over the years. And we're talking about something that's probably been 10 years in, in concept and validation. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but if I was ever to go get money, I always wanted to be in a situation where I was commercially strong. So I've got a product, I've got customers looking to come on board. Now if I go ask for money, I've got a valid product with revenue. Even the revenue is 10 bucks a month. Um, mm -hmm. Someone's prepared to pay for it, which is much stronger than, it's a great idea, I've, I've sunk a whole lot of cash into the bullet and no one's bought it yet. Um, yeah. The terms are not gonna be good on that. So, so that's where we are. Um, so the only reason I would take funds right now is to go faster. Okay, no, I think that makes sense. So let's maybe talk about competition. You know, how's who can knock you off your plans to continue to grow and uh, continue to bootstrap this? And off the top of my head, it sounds like perhaps it's other consulting services and they say, hey, I already have a consultant. I don't need your SaaS tool. Yeah. I'm good or or not doing so, anything. Yeah, and, and, and this is this is when people ask me about who our competitors are, it's always tricky to answer because we – you, if you look at the pieces of what we've built, each piece might have a competitor. So I mentioned Jira, I mentioned Asana, I mentioned Monday as a project planning OKR tool. Those exist. So yes, those are competitors, and we're priced pretty similar to those guys. Um, when you look at at risk management and ISO twenty seven K and and that sort of stuff, you'll have products that do that stuff fairly well, um, and we're much cheaper than those guys. But I haven't seen anyone yet who really does the templating and the, the, the scenarios really well. And I don't want to say we're the only, only product in the world that does it because that's not fair. I haven't done that far research. But when I talk to people and I ask them, have you seen this before? And when I talk to people, I'm talking about CIOs, CTOs, you know, senior tech leaders that have been around a long time, they haven't seen it. Um, mm -hmm. Because it, in, in discreteness, they've seen it, but not as a combined offering. So I think that's where our, our unique selling position is. And specifically in the cases where you go to a customer and they are looking for an independent platform that they can bring not only their users into, so you know the customer's users, their solution provider users in, and a, and a third-party consulting firm into. So I think what we do really well is we bring everybody together to solve the problem. And we're not, we're not there to be a competitor. We're there to make sure that the customer gets their value. Um, so all those consulting mm -hmm. firms that I run into and they go, oh, we've got this thing. I said, well, that's fine. We are, we're here if you, if you need it. We're not trying to comp compete. We'd rather give you, get you empowered and use it with your customers and, um, you know, see how we can help you. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that's fair. I think you have a, a good niche and you're certainly differentiated. So what is the end goal? Maybe we can just end with this as you, as you look out to the far future for, for value for your for a company, um, is it an acquisition? Is it just to create a privately held, very profitable enterprise? It, it's 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 my legacy, I guess, um, in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. So, I mean, it may not be always mine in the sense of there might be people that put money into it and have some ownership in it, but I don't ever want to sell it completely at this stage um, mm -hmm. because it's, it's what I love to do. I love to come into a business, hear what their problems are, and then figure out what the solution is and what the path is and so, and then go and solve it. Um, and if I do that till, till my last breath, then that'll be great. So this is in some senses, my retirement plan, my, my lifestyle business, my, but I'm not a, I'm not a sit back and wait kind of person. So it's, it's an aggressive thing to go out and, you know, get out to people's hands. And I think it comes down to a South African thing. I mean, I'm, I'm South African by birth and the mm -hmm. phrase we, we call Ubuntu, which means I am because we are. Um, and it sounds like it's a weird way of saying things, but basically it means that I'm only good because I've got good people around me um, and I've helped people be better um, and they will help me to be better. So that's really the, the value proposition for us as well, is that we want to have you know, as many good stories as we can for success, but also where we haven't been successful, we want to use those lessons and put it back into the system to make it better for the mm -hmm. next time around. Uh, and that's, that would be the ideal goal, is that we have this expert system that's just better and better every year. Yeah, so it sounds like at the root, it's really about helping people, providing value. Um, yep. So let's maybe shift to to you. I mean, is that is that your why, or why are you doing this? Why why be an entrepreneur? Why not follow a more traditional path? It's exactly that. I, I am I'm that person that gets frustrated in a coffee queue because it's inefficient, ineffective, and could be done better. And I want to tell somebody how to fix it. So I, I look at it from those points, you know, that point of view all the time. And instead of being frustrated and being a, a bad customer, I'd rather provide a way that we could share the knowledge of 
how that could be done better. And I'm, and I will leave like, for example, in that, which I did yesterday, which is why I pulled the example out. I actually gave the person who was the manager running that coffee shop, my number to phone me so I could, I could talk to them about what I experienced and how they could improve it. So it, <laughs> okay. it, it is my thing. I just, I just enjoy that kind of stuff. Um, and when I was given this opportunity based on, on, um, you know, just, just timing and all the rest of it, it was that, you know, how would I build something that could forever help the people that I talk to every day and hear all their problems. And my career has been one where I've moved to many companies. So I've learned a lot of stuff. Um, it, it's like playing poker. The more, the more hands you play, the more games you play, the better you get. But mm -hmm. you only get really good because you've got to play against more people that have different mannerisms, behaviors, knowledge, et cetera. And how do you capture that and apply it into, into the business world? So when I go and talk to a customer and they've got this problem, I go, huh, okay, I've seen this problem before. We did this at X, Y, and Z. This is how we solve the problem there. May not be the same solution, but we could probably try something similar. Now, everyone thinks they, their problems are unique, and they, and they largely are if you look at all the variables. But if you look at the common theme and the major variables, they're pretty much the same problem. A sales process yeah. is still a sales process. A renewal process mm -hmm. is still a renewal process. If you look at the core business processes that run our entire business from contract to billing, it's still the same thing. You've got to get a customer to sign. Sure. You've got to get, got to get the work done so you can bill it. It's still the same. It's still the same process. But what is different about that are all the variables inside that business. Are they multinational? Are they, um, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, whatever, all those things. And trying to repeat those things and provide those things as, as aids to a customer, that's, that's the trick. And that's the thing that gets me really excited is trying to find ways to do that, which is what value is yeah. there to do is to capture and then also, you know, keep the score. You know, I come from a competitive nation. We keep the score and everything. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. No, I, I think that's great. So to my next question, we, you know, we, we've been pretty optimistic throughout the the podcast and interview and, you know, you're looking to grow and you're providing all this value. But do you ever wake up, you know, that starting a business doesn't come without its challenges. Do you ever wake up and regret starting your own business and regret the path that you've gone down? Um, no, no. I mean, if anything, mm -hmm. um, okay. my, my, my regrets would have, and, 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 and you know, maybe I should have started this sooner. Um, but I think the way things have worked out from a timing point of view, I couldn't have actually timed it better at this stage. Um, it was a, it was a pretty low risk period when I started it. Um, we bought the software with a, with a product that exists that, that my backup plan was if I didn't, if the developers didn't work out, I could always do the work myself. Um, yeah. so I never felt like I, I had nowhere to go. Um, when I started the business, I had enough capital put away to, to fund it so I could hire somebody straight away to run the product. So I mitigated the risk of my availability being an issue. Uh, and that's not to say that, that there weren't issues. I mean, one of the biggest problems when you, when you build a, a product, if the product's all in your head, um, and then you brain dump it to everybody else, you can't expect them to have the same vision, understanding and context that you have. So you have to give them time to digest and get up to speed. So we had a lot, we had a lot of, of that for the first few months. And, and mm -hmm. my regret there is probably that I didn't spend the time then making sure that the team was well versed in what was required and, and, um, and a more, a less complicated path than we probably, we probably made it more complicated. That it was, uh, that it needed to be, but yeah, no regrets. Um, I think it's an exciting option and I think it solves the problems for everybody and I think it helps everybody. And, I, and we've, we've started a community around it. Um, which is ironic because um, I only plan a community in like three years time or even next year at the earliest. And we've got a community of, of value execs, which are people like myself that go and help a customer that has a problem. Um, and and mm -hmm. that's a CEO, CIO, CTO, or whatever senior person. Uh, they take the tool in as well. Um, and then we also have um, training material that we've developed to go with, with the product because we want people to, to know some of the stuff that we know um that everyone gets the same level of base knowledge so they can go that a little bit further each time so there's there's a lot of stuff we've just by doing this has 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 really filled a lot of the the wants and and, and goals of my my life really uh, and i say it's a legacy thing as well my kids will have it yeah you know um no i think that's amazing so yeah i i want to 
kind of shift to like self-improvement or what are you working on as the leader? Or what is one skill that you're working to, to develop over the next six months to a year that'll help take value AI to the next level? A, a few things. Uh, one is leverage. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've really, it's really clicked for me this, this last year. Um, you know, it's very easy to, to go and advise and, and earn money and then keep it all for yourself and, and not, 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 scale uh versus mm -hmm. you know spending the money on the right kind of people to help you do things that you don't that you shouldn't be doing like you know i used to do all my marketing i'm not a marketing person but i used to do it because i was too uh controlling to or and i didn't want to pay for somebody and now i'm paying somebody and she's really good uh, and it's just taken a whole lot of stress off me um the community i used to you know everything i well and, and maybe this is a good thing too everything i start i always run at first and then i hire somebody that's become my new sort of mm -hmm. approach so I understand how it works before I hand, before I go hire somebody and before I hand it over. But that leverage piece is really great because now, and I was talking to someone about it today, um, when I have busy periods with customers, when they're throwing their, their toys out the cot, so to speak, um, and I need to go in deep and help them out, the business doesn't stop because I'm not there. It might slow mm -hmm. down. I might still be a bottleneck for one or two decisions or whatever, but I'm trying, I try and power my teams as much as possible to do stuff all my people at least so that they own it uh, and they own the result of it and yes there might be cases where they do something completely different to what i would do and i've got to check myself and go you know you can't cross you can't you can't correct them because maybe they actually do something that, that you hadn't thought of that's got more value than what you would have done so there's that learning mm -hmm. as well so i think you know from a self-improvement point of view it's it's giving up control uh, so the business mm -hmm. can, so the business can grow uh it's staying focused on what are the what are the real value things for the product and for the offerings we have? So simple and, and effective, um, and then just not burning out. Yeah, hundred percent. Do you think about some of the other things you're doing as leverage as well? Obviously, you're building a software product, and so there's no cost of replication for that platform you're building. So I would say that code is also leverage. Yep. Um, and then you talked about capital, right? Um, considering perhaps taking funding down the line and that would obviously allow you to grow, improve the code and hire more people and grow faster. So I don't know if you think of those as, as leverage as well. Yeah, it is. I, I, and that's exactly it. So, so the reason why I've, I haven't gone out for funding yet is because I, when I have those discussions, I want to have the maximum leverage I can get out of those conversations. So, it's, mm -hmm. you know, and it's been interesting in the sense that I've been working with other people who are also found in their own things some that have taken funds from day one, some that are like me, are bootstrapping. And in some cases you have to, there's, there's no way to do what you want to do unless you've got funds raised. Um, and mm -hmm. I've seen the stress that goes with that. Uh, in the same token, I've seen others where the, the other one that, that's in parallel to me at the moment, they are, they're self-funding, but they're running out of runway and they're getting, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want to say desperate, that's not, not fair. But they get to the point where they're, they're willing to take the, any deal to keep it going. Um, mm. And they're losing objectivity on, on how good their idea is and all that stuff because of, of the emotional stuff that's going on. And, and I'm trying to sort of stay on the, in the middle of that where we are we're on the right track. We're getting good traction. Um, and then when we had that conversation to go faster, to increase our leverage, we're in a strong position to have those discussions. And I think that if that works, then that, that would be... If I look back five years from now and I look back and go, we'll be in the right position, I probably won't, I won't second guess the decision I, you know, I make on that because I think we've, we've played mm -hmm. it the right way. Yeah, no, I think that's smart of you. You, you have to be diligent and, and seek funding at the right time to be successful. Um, okay, so I just have a couple more questions for you. Sure. Uh, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your 18 year old self? Don't drink alcohol. Don't drink alcohol? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to elaborate on that as well? I mean, I, I think I could relate to that a bit in that it, you know, I think if you don't drink, you don't spend your 20s partying, you know, you can accomplish a lot more. So 100%. 100%. And I mean, I'm, I've got a, so Ben, who runs our community, he's at that 18 year old stage. We had, we had a chat the other night about it. And he said, it's an impediment. Now, I've never seen it as an impediment, but he said, and, and the, the way he said it was very smart, is that 
it's all fine and well to go and have those parties and all the rest of it. But then it's the next day that you lose. And the next day is actually the important mm-hmm. day. It's not and then and my view has always been it's not it's not so much the, the, the next day that you lose, it's the bad decisions you make after that that you don't even realise are bad decisions because you're hungover, mm-hmm. you're slow, you eat badly, you get into a bad rut, et cetera, et cetera. Now mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I consciously don't drink very, very much. I mean if it if any I mean I had on my birthday which was four months three months ago and actually I've lost the taste completely for alcohol. Um, and I used to, and I grew up in South Africa. We got the best wine in the world. Um, yeah. And I used to drink bottles of wine every in a night. And um, you know, the thought of drinking a glass of wine now makes me, you know, physically ill. Um, so and 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 because of and the reason why I'm bringing it up, and, and and he talked about impediment, but I took I look at it more from a, from a maximizing point of view. I can push harder because I'm healthier, and I can sleep less mm-hmm. for periods because I'm. I've optimized that. So I kind of, you know, I kind of sugar periods as well. And then I, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Now all these things in moderation are fine. You can have them, you know, once in a while. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's, if, if I look back on my life, you know, that, that your twenties, you know, that I had a lot of good stuff that I could have done and, yeah. and I didn't because of, of a hangover or, a, you know, multiple, you know, all the partying, you know, days and weeks of, of university and all the rest of it. So that's number one. Yeah. What what advice would you give someone that wants to cut back or quit drinking, right? Because I think it's it's easier said than done. And I think it sounds like you're in a good place now, but it, it's it, societal, from my perspective, it just takes time. Right? Yeah, societal pressure is rough. I mean, my, my wife yeah. and I thought about it. I mean, you know, she got all pissed off at me. She's like, I'll never drink a glass of wine with you again. I said, well, I wouldn't say never, but it's probably not going to be likely. Uh, and it doesn't mean I won't have a mm-hmm. sip of, of it, for example. Like, I might just taste it, but it, it won't it doesn't do anything if i don't drink at all so i think the, the, the for me it was cold turkey uh like i just stopped and and you know mm-hmm. i think you know fortunately in this world we live in now and, and it's ironic it's a covid helped so in south africa they banned alcohol during covid for periods of time hmm. now culturally in south africa it's as bad as most countries where alcohol is freely available you know it's alcohol is part of your life uh, and and, mm-hmm. and, and when they banned alcohol, there's obviously the black market where you could get the stuff, you know, paying a lot of a premium. But what the what the manufacturers did is they generated a whole new line of products. There were low alcohol, no alcohol alternatives. So all the things that I used to enjoy drinking as a, you know, teenager, et cetera, are now available as a no no alcohol option. So we're back yeah. we're back in the UK now, and I have a Guinness every night, but it's a Guinness zero alcohol beer. Now the calories on, on, on the Guinness, you know, like 250, 300 calories with the alcohol, without the alcohol, they're 75, 80, something like that. So mm. it's, you know, from a, an actual impact on your body, you know, it's just, a, it's a really strong, a really weak milkshake. Um, yeah. And you get the taste and you get the taste that you like. Uh, but yeah, cold turkey, um, and then you just got to be prepared to to have those, you know, people that'll go, oh, come on, just one drink. You know, we had people who were over for lunch and they were threatening tequilas and Jager bombs and whatever. I said, well, you can have them. I'm not stopping you, but I'm not going to have one. I'll even pay for yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. But I'm not having it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just got to keep keep pushing ahead. So I, I get it, though. That That is a challenge, and I... I... I resonate with that 100%. So maybe one final question here, and then I'll give you the sure. floor and, and we can and close it out. Uh, so for anyone out there that wants to start a business or a startup, what is the first step that you recommend they take? Um, well, I do a lot of, I mean, it's funny, I have lots of ideas. So I do, and, and this is the other thing, because I don't drink, I have a lot more time than everybody else. So I have a lot of things that mm-hmm. I just start. So this is my method when I want to start a new business. And it's not my method. I started from a book that I read called The $100 Startup. Um, you literally go register the domain, you create a web page with a capture form, and you get you, you put it online and you see how many people respond to it. And if you get any responses, depending on what the responses are, you can just you can confirm whether it's actually got an appetite or not. And that's without any marketing. Um, if you start getting some responses, then you do some marketing and you see. But I'm not, and I, I don't pay for ads and stuff like that. I just mark to people that I know and, and all the rest and see what happens. And I did this with value execs. I literally did this uh, probably uh, two months, one one week ago. Um, a lot of people I was chatting to when I was trying to sell them on the SaaS product, 
uh, were asking me, well, actually, more interested in how you do fractional work. How do you get advisory work? Your, your sort of part-time stuff. You know, that, that we want to know how you do. And mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out what was the actual problem with that? What, what were they really asking me? And then the biggest risk when you move from being a full-time employee to being fractional or advisory, and I'm sure you know this, is you don't have that continuous check every month for your salary because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. now you've got to go find that work. And then when you are doing advisory and, and fractional work, you are in some cases beholden to your client. So you can be really rammed into you know high-pressure project for three months, so you have no time to do anything else. And then as that project gets to the end and they're like, and they say, oh, we're not going to renew you because we don't need you anymore. Then you start doing yeah. your business development or your networking again to try and get something next. But that takes time. So the number one problem we solve with value execs is that lead generation is always going, that, that, that pipeline. And there's various ways we do it. And the, and the way that I validated that idea is I basically went onto LinkedIn. I've got a pretty big following on LinkedIn for, from years and years of connecting with people, et cetera. And I just yeah. published the form on a LinkedIn page and this, how many, how many opportunities do I get from this? So, so, and it was just literally content every day. And I use Taplio, which is a very good LinkedIn content generator. And I literally just set up a month's worth of content and then I let it run. In fact, I've, I've, I've written a, a training course for this. It's in my, it's in our community, um, which I'm happy to share a link to and just see how many opportunities I've got. And, and I've had, I got three within the first month, three customers. And I mean, I have various networks I'm involved in anyway, WhatsApp groups and and uh, other communities that I'm a part of. So they, I always knew there were people that if I got if I got opportunities needing a fractional, I always knew there was someone I could find to come and do the fractional work. So it wasn't like I was worried about having too much demand and and no people. Um, but what I've done with running the the value execs marketing and and one of the reasons why I hired the marketing person is I've now started getting continuous leads every week, even in the quietest period of the year, which is August in the UK. Mm. Nothing happens. Mm -hmm. We're getting leads um, mm. because there's demand. There are people running businesses that need an advisor, someone they can trust, who's an expert, but they can't afford the full price of that person. You know, you're talking a, a six-figure salary. They, don't, they can't afford that, but they can afford a four-figure, five-figure number, you know, 10, 20K, to bring somebody yeah. in for a short period of time you can coach their salesperson, help them grow, help them pivot, and there's value there. And, and we don't get involved in the commercial deal with the customer. So if I get a guy who comes to me and says, I need a, a CFO fractionally, and I know a CFO and I connect them together, I don't get involved in the deal. That's the, that's the thing. And that's one of the biggest things we've seen with these communities. Everyone wants to own it. All we care about is the customer got what they wanted. So we'll ask them afterwards, like a trust pilot. Um, and, and that seems to be working. It, as a, as a, as yeah. a way to do it so and then that feeds in our product because we go we have an exec that goes and helps a customer with our product and if they want to use it and the customer sees value and then they've, they're like oh what's this all this other stuff you've already helped me with one thing how yeah. else can you help me um and we often help for free because you know what's an hour conversation where i can help five people Mm hmm. A hundred percent. So yeah it sounds like you have other startups other than value ai but it feeds into the other one so i think that's interesting and I think it kind of breaks the mold of like, hey, you don't need a lot to test your idea and put things out there, right? So anybody with well, an idea can, well, can that, get that, the ball Well, that $100 value, I mean, you know, Taplio for a month, I think cost me $38. And I think uh, Typeform, which is the survey tool I use, cost me 50 And then I bought the domain. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe it was $120, something like that. But, you know, for, for that, yeah. I, you know, I've now got a business, I've got you know, community that's growing uh, of, of like-minded people who, and I say like-minded, says they're all fractionals, who are looking for the same thing. And when I'm now looking for potentially advisory work in the future, the pipeline's already running. I don't have to go and build a new pipeline. It's already there. Yeah, 100%. So I got to close out here, but I'll give the floor sure. to you. How can people learn more about you, Ryan Purvis, and uh, Value AI? Yeah, so, so they can come to our website, which is getvalue.com, uh, and value is spelled V-A-L-U-U. -U. Um, and then they can get me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place to get me. Uh, and I, I, you know, all right. I accept all connections, and I respond to all messages myself, so they can, they can reach out to you there. Very nice. Ryan, I appreciate you taking the time. I will put your uh, 
the link to your LinkedIn profile and your website in the description. And yeah, I wish you the best of luck with Value AI. Appreciate your time and thanks for listening to me, Drone On.